Okay. So, so for this last lecture, we'd like to cover uh, two topics, two short topics. One of them is momentum twisters. which are very nice variables, which uh, uh, in many of these calculations make your life nice. nice. And the, yeah, the momentum twisters were invented in the context of this dual conformal symmetry in order to make it manifest. So the, but they are very closely related to the old twisters of Penrose. So, I recall that the dual conformal symmetry becomes visible when we look at the amplitudes in the dual momentum space. So if all the momenta, sorry, coming into an amplitude are like this, we introduce region momenta yi, y plus one, such that yi minus y, i minus one is equal to pi. And then we have a conformal symmetry acting on these wires. This is a very good, there's a standard trick to linearize the action of conformal symmetry, which is to introduce six vector. Because the conformal symmetry is SO4 comma two, let's just call it SO6 to be, uh, yeah, not, not too formal. So this is following six vectors, which has components y, y i mu, so four of the components are the one you start with. And the two extra components are two null coordinates, y i plus, which I will set to one, and y i minus, which I will set to y i mu square. And the metric is such that this vector is a null six dimensional vector. And then conformal symmetry become, conformal transformation become rotations on this space. So this notation is very useful and people use it in the uh, CFT bootstrap, for example, to do calculations in conformal field theory. So it makes conformal invariants easy to see. They're just rotations of this vector. So yeah, S O four comma two rotation, conformal transformation are just these rotations. So we're already halfway to define the uh, momentum twisters. Momentum twisters are just the spinners of these guys. So if you have a null vector in six dimension, it's a uh, mathematical fact that it can be written as a product of two spinners. So y is equal to, I will call the two spinners ZA and ZB. And what are the indices here? The way it works is that SO6 is like SU4, and the spinners are in the four. So, these guys are four spinners. And if you take the anti-symmetric product of two such spinners, you get a vector. So a null vector can be written as an anti-symmetric product of two of these four, two of these spinners, and these are called twisters. You have two twisters, you make a point. The, in the context of amplitude, the way this is used is that for in, in a specific context, you define the following object. So we have all of these points, and to each of these points, each point corresponds to two twisters, but to turn out that the twisters will be shared among neighbors. So we really just need n twisters. N momentum twisters. And they're defined by the following formula. 
The first two components are the lambda spinner we've seen before. And the bottom two components are lambda i alpha. They are related to these y coordinates, y i alpha alpha dot. So the alpha index is contract. So this has an alpha and alpha dot index. And one thing that can be shown is that if you take zi wedge zi plus 1, that gives a matrix, so that gives a 2 by 4 matrix, which is lambda i, lambda, til, uh, lambda i plus 1, dot, dot, dot here. But the wedge product, you, you can shift, you can change the basis as much as you want. And this becomes proportional to 1, 1, up to just the reshuffling of the columns. This is proportional to y, i. Alpha, alpha, dot. So this is the way that the vector yi is encoded in this product. So given, given z's, you extract lambdas, extract lambdas, y's, and lambda tildes. So we can extract all the data given the z's, and you can go both ways because this map is, is, is explicit. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between twisters and, and on-shell kinematics. And momentum conservation is automatically solved because defining the momenta as differences like that, they automatically add up to zero. So it's a very nice variable. They solve mo both momentum conservation and on-shell conditions for you automatically. Yes, there's a cyclic identification. So uh, y n plus one is equal to y one. But it's not a constraint here. This constraint is automatically satisfied. So I give you a set of y's. I just have to give you y one to y n, and and n plus one you define as y one. There's no constraint. Uh, yeah. So instead of having uh, four constraints, now we have four symmetry because you can shift the y's as much as you want, and this equation is unchanged. So you solve the four constraints and replace them by four symmetries. Yeah. So I don't have so much time. So what I want to, to show you is some uh, uh, application of these twisters. So to, they, they're useful to rewrite the amplitudes in a, uh, in a way which makes the, uh, the symmetry manifest. So. The basic step, so recall that the amplitudes are proportional to, we can always pull out a, this supersymmetry delta function. I and I, this is like delta eight Q. We can always pull out this factor in front of the amplitude and define a rescale amplitude, which doesn't have this factor. The amplitude, uh, the super amplitude has weight, so it receives some phase if we rotate the lambdas. And a very natural way to absorb this phase is to divide by this denominator. So we define objects like this. And then this mn we can write in terms of, of twisters. Yeah, so this, this mn depends on the on, on twisters. Because we have a recursion relation for A, one can derive a recursion relation for M. It's just a, a simple algebraic step to carry out what this factor does. So I give the answer. So the BCF recursion took the following form. We had that the amplitude for N particle, if we shifted N and N1, we did this shift. The amplitude was expressed as a sum of product of lower point amplitude, 
where shifted one was on one side, shifted it on one side, and the sum run over all channels in which you can cut the planar amplitude. So this is BCF recursion. And one can write an equation. One can write this equation at the level of the m -ends. And the answer is simply mn, so z1 goes to zn. One term is just the m2, one less twisters. That takes care of one channel where you have three point vertex a. And then the rest, there's a sum over j, which runs from two to n minus three of, there's a prefactor which replaced this propagator, which turns out to be involved this funny bracket, which I will explain in a second, of five twisters, one j, j plus one, n, oh sorry, n minus, n minus one, n, times the product of m, some m on the left, which involves twisters one, of two j, and the exchange particle from twister associated to this guy, and some m on the right, which involves m, j plus one, n. So that's the answer. So let's look at some cases. So the basic property of this bracket is that it's proportional to four fermions, proportional to uh, for fermions. So for MHV, all the fermions are zero. For MHV amplitude, which have all but two negativity gluons, these two negativity gluons are absorbed by this factor. And the recursion, we can ignore this term, and the recursion is simply M, Mn equal Mn minus one, and they all equal to one. So in the first lecture, we struggled to derive the MHV amplitude by the recursion, but now we're building on this, on the fact that we've already done this, and now the MHV amplitude is trivial. We've just pulled out this factor that we worked so hard to derive in the first place. For NMHV, now we have to work to first order in this bracket. So in this sum, these Ns are just one. So at NMHV, the recursion is very simple to solve. Mn is equal to sum over Ij of one, I, I plus one, Jj plus one. Some examples, M5 is one, two, three, four, five. M6 is one, two, three, four, five, which is the M5 term, plus one, two, three, Five six plus one three four five six. So that's NMHV. And you can keep going. Ten square MHV gets more complicated, but you get some sum of products of two of these brackets. So this gives a very, very compact way of solving the recursion. In the, this object, essentially, with this compact notation, you can essentially fit the answer in your head, which is very, very striking. And what is this bracket? It's made out of the simplest SU4, and of the simplest, it's the simplest SU4 slash 4 invariant. One thing I haven't told you is that we need to supersymmetrize these twisters here. There's a, uh, yeah. You can, uh, these, these twisters are explained and the, the, the good way, the good reference, which is, which is still a good place to read about this, is what was the original reference. It's a paper by Hodges, 0905.47, 1473. Yeah. You can define these, these datas. 
The, so this bracket is the basic environment. It's the basic SU4 slash 4 environment, and it's built out of the simplest SU4 environment, which is a determinant. I, J, K, L equal to determinant of Z, I, Z, J, Z, K, Z, L. You can make a supersymmetric environment that I, J, K, L, M is equal to, you made it out of these simpler environments, SU4 slash 4. That was one, so I, J, K, L, J, K, L, N, all the cyclic products up to M, I, J, K. And on top is a delta, fermionic delta function, I, J, K, L, chi, what chi is, uh, is, is this guy? Chi M M Chi M some R symmetry index plus cyclic. So it's a rather compact object and to evaluate it it's just computing a bunch of determinants. So the amplitude at any number of points is expressed in terms of products of such determinants. So what is the upshot? of this formula. So the following facts are true. So first, the dual conformal symmetry is manifest. So for all, well, A manifested for all trees, any number of points. And, and, and this is just the SU4 slash 4 environment. The, you can write it algebraically as J A B of M N is equal to zero, where J A B is a sum of particles of Z I D over D Z I. It's just the generator of rotation. There's a, something which is not obvious, but is a true fact, is that there's actually a yang-yang symmetry. Which holds for each term of the expression. It's true actually term-wise in this, in this recursion. So there's something like a level one generator, mn, which is equal to zero, and but this level one guy is defined as sum over i smaller than j of essentially a commutator of z i d over z i, z j d over z j, with a b and c. And the simple way to see that this has to be there is that this contains in particular some elements of the ordinary conformal transformation. So by this variable we made the dual conformal symmetry of the theory manifest, but the theory also has a conformal symmetry. And when you express it in terms of these variables, it takes this more complicated form. And when you commute this level zero and level one guy, when you commute level one guy with each other, you get infi an infinite algebra. So this was completely unclear if 
you just compute Feynman diagrams or even from the recursion in the first lecture, it was completely unclear that the amplitudes had this symmetry. But in this form, using these variables, the symmetry becomes, becomes visible. Uh, another fact is that the, the recursion can be extended the level of the loop integral. And essentially, at the loop level, one adds a term. So at loop level, in the planar limit, you have all sorts of, uh, uh, of loops that you, uh, that you answer that are labeled by extra variable, y0, y0 prime, y0 prime prime. And in the recursion, you get terms where these loops just get open apart, just cut in the middle. And there's an extra term where you cut open one of these loops. There's a term that looks like schematically like that. One and something I would call like that, that opens. not meant to represent any, uh, yeah, any kind of insect, but uh, yeah. So, so there's a generalization to loop level, and that recursion also makes this symmetry manifest to our loop order. So, yeah. so that's one way we know for sure that the symmetry is there. In addition to the t-duality argument from ADS-CFT that I mentioned previously. Uh, Chris, uh, yeah. Is yeah, so that's a good question. So at three level, it's linearly realized. At loop level, so the loop integral is covariant under the symmetry, but that's the integral. When you do the integrals, funny things happen, and the, the statement is that the uh, uh, loop amplitude is invariant under a deformed yang yang, which is not linearly realized. So it changes the number of particles. Loop integral, so I would just write. So then we under a modified yang yang, which is not, not linear. Yeah. Yeah. So we wrote it down to, to our, Lord. well, we wrote down what it what was the modification in a, in a paper by uh, myself and Song Yi. Build, building on previous work by Beiser and others. And another fact I want to mention is that this kind of structure, ii plus one, jj plus one, that occurs naturally when you solve this recursion kind of structures occurs naturally when you solve certain geometry problem. And an example is if you have a convex polygon, I just tell you it's convex. It's a bit of a trivial example, but you have a convex polynomial with points i, i plus one, i plus two, blah, blah, blah. The boundaries are, are i plus one, they involve consecutive guys. So in general, when you have geometry problems which involve complex, uh, convex objects, occurs in convex geometry problem, whenever you have some kind of convex problems, this, this kind of thing occur naturally. And this was generalized to, uh, this simple problem was generalized to a more complicated geometry problem which reproduced all the, all the structure by, uh, by uh, Nima Kanihamid and Jaroslav Tronka. So Nima may or may not 
talk about it in this lecture soon. But yeah, so I, I would just mention it, that this leads to a, uh, an interpretation of the amplitude as the volume of a certain convex object, which we would call the amplitude with one. Whose faces somehow of the correct combinatorics that they reproduce all this I ah, plus one, JJ plus one patterns. So, yeah. It's unfortunate that we really don't have more time to discuss this, but yeah, I wanted to mention it. And yeah, the last thing I want to mention about trees is that I hope I didn't overemphasize the trees during these lectures. So I, this, you shouldn't get the impression that this business is about computing trees. This business is really about computing loops. But people, me, some people here, you, you do all these complicated computation, loop computations, you get some answer, you realize there's some amazing structure, and then you try to understand it, and then ultimately it always boils down to an amazing property of the trees that were there and you were sitting in your face for years and you just had not recognized it. So the trees are really, uh, are really important. Even though at the end, really the business is about, it's about computing loops. And yeah, last thing I want to say about the trees, you, no longer, you, don't, you don't really have to evaluate these things by hand anymore because there are computer packages which do that for you. So if you need to compute some tree amplitude for some process, so you would just want to stare at what the expression look like. I mentioned this one package by my colleague uh, Jake Bourgeli, bcfw.m, it's in 10, 11.2447, so you can get an analytic expression for any amplitude you, you fancy, and yeah, 2447. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to say about, about trees and tree amplitudes. The second thing I would like to, to do to wrap up these lectures is to discuss the cusp and the dimension in n equals 4. So what is this object? So scattering amplitudes have Entire divergences. They actually have soft and coordinate divergences. So the scattering amplitude, there's a well developed theory for these divergences. Essentially, they, they exponentiate. That's uh, the simplest, uh, the main thing you should know about these divergences is that they exponentiate. And it's essentially due because, they, because of Wilson pictures that degrees of freedom at different length scales decouple from each other. So very infrared radiation, decoupled from hard processes that lead to exponentiation. In the case of a planar, the exponent in general, it exponentiates, but you still have to compute the exponent. The exponent is particularly simpler in the planar conformal field theories, but there's a completely general story, but for planar CFTs, the exponent takes the form, some coefficient, Called the cusp anomalous dimension. For some reason, there's a factor of eight. Some were particles, then some log square of pi dot pi plus one over infrared cutoff times some constant. And this pi dot pi plus one arises from soft gluons emitted between two adjacent legs in the amplitude. If you want to know the general story as well as a sort of modern proof of this exponentiation, I recommend a recent paper by Fage and Schwartz in 2009. 
2014. So it's a well understood theory. Yeah. And at the end of the day, when you compute physical scattering process, as usual, what matters is uh, this cutoff scale becomes over normalization scale, becomes finite. And for example, if you have a process involving narrow jets with energy E, the exponent will look something like the cross section will have an exponent, something like gamma cost four, it's a factor of two because you square the amplitude to get the cross section. And one of the log is collinear, so it will involve this cone angle. And the other log is soft. So if you have two jets and you have energy smaller than a, if you instead the energy outside your jet is smaller than a certain cutoff, you have E or you have a ratio like that. So there's a soft log and there's a corneal log. In general, I'm to have for jets of this form. And yeah, because much of LHC physics about jets, these logs, and this coefficient is an important observable in quantum field theory. In n equals four, it turns out that this gamma cusp can be calculated to all orders using integrability. And so to relate gamma cusp to a spin chain, for example, as I mentioned yesterday, the way to go is that this gamma cusp involves collinear physics. So it involves what is called twist operators, operators of low twist. Which, and it turns out that the soft divergence turn out, just turns out that they're related to large spin. So one has to look at operators of low twist and large spin, just turns out. The, oops, so for example, if one can calculate the anomalous dimension of the operator trace of from scalar field, a derivative to the S and another scalar field where V is a null vector, that's a covariant derivative, if you know the anomalous dimension of these operators, which have twist two, because the vector is null, the spin, if you know this at large spin, you know gamma cusp. So the dimension of O minus, sorry, yeah, dimension for OS minus the spin goes to gamma cusp. There may be a fact, probably a factor of two, log S plus a constant. So, is the, so at large spin, there's a growth in gamma cost is a coefficient of this log. So, if, so in that way, this coefficient, which occurs in amplitude, is related to something you can calculate from these local operators, which is mapped to this integrable spin chain. The fact that you can map this problem to an integrable spin chain doesn't mean that it's easy. There are many hard problems involving spin chains. It turns out, but this turns out to be a problem that can be solved. And, yeah. and yeah. I wish I could tell you something about how it was solved and so on, but I think it's even more interesting to discuss the answer. And the answer is the following. from Beisert, Eden, and Stadecker around 2006, 2007. And the answer is the following. Define a matrix Kij whose matrix elements are 2j minus 1 and ij plus 1 some integral, dt over t, Bessel function of i to gt, Bessel function of j to gt, divided by et minus one. Then, 
gamma cusp is equal to 4 g square times the inverse of 1 plus k, the top left component of that big matrix. So k is an infinite dimensional matrix. So this is a bit formal, but let me explain. So in practice, the coefficient, uh, the matrix element of k, let's compute the first one, for example. k11, let's assume that the coupling is small. And g is, uh, uh, yeah, g square is, is, in this equation is lambda over 16 by square. If the coupling is small, you see that because of this exponential factor, we care only about t over order one, and then the argument of the Bessel function is small. So we can, so k11 involves Bessel function one, and which is just linear in its argument. So k11 is approximately 2g, sorry, 2j, this is one, times equal to zero to infinity, dt over t, and the Bessel function gives gt squared, divided by et minus one, and integral dt t over this is that of Riemann zeta function, two j that one, so that gives two times zeta function of two, which is uh, pi square over three, so it's times g squared. So the matrix elements of k are small in perturbation theory. And in general, kij is over the j, g, g to the i plus j. So they get smaller and smaller. So if you want to compute this inverse, for example, to 20 loop orders, you just need to keep terms of order j, g to the 40. So if you just keep, if you, if you want 20 loops, just keep 40 by 40 matrix, invert it. I cannot do that, but the computer can do that. So the problem is essentially solved. And even when the coupling is strong, the matrix elements go to zero at large entry. So even if the coupling is 10 or whatever, you can still get numerics out of that matrix. And there are other ways to solve this at strong coupling. So what does the solution look like? It's really the first quantity which was successfully interpolated between weak and strong coupling. So on this axis, I put g square, which is lambda over 16 pi square. On this axis, I put gamma cusp. At weak coupling, so we basically computed it to the two loop order here. Gamma cusp is four g square times one minus pi square over three g square plus order g four. So it starts like four g square. So it starts linearly. At strong coupling, it goes, it dampens down. So it doesn't flatten up, but it dampens down. At strong coupling, gamma is approximately two g. At weak coupling, gamma approximately 4g squared. The strong coupling result is in agreement with uh, strings in ADS. Yeah. Yeah, let, let me rewrite this here. What else can we say about this perturbative expansion? So this is a rather explicit result. One thing that people have extracted from it is that uh, the weak coupling expansion converge. So 
this is an agreement with uh, the general argument that Markov gave in his lectures. And it converts because we're doing large NC. In general, the Teoft expansion at large NC is expected to converge in some radius. And here we can actually compute what the radius is. And it turns out to be that G is equal to one quarter, which can also be written as lambda is equal to pi square. Or if you like alpha strong types quantity, alpha strong should be uh, G square Yang Mills over four pi. That would be equal to pi over four Ns. So that's, uh, that's the radius of convergence of the series. And when you pass this point, you can say that you've entered a strong coupling regime. That's where the transition between weak and strong coupling is. You can look at the strong coupling expansion. There, the, the expansion is the alpha prime expansion of string theory. This expansion turns out to be asymptotic. It turns out to be non borel summable. And the problem is that this is what, this is what Marcos described as a renormalon, which occurs because this string theory contains a asymptotically free SO6 model in it, which has a non perturbative scale, sort of like lambda QCD, which goes like m order e to the uh, 1 over g. At some, the coupling at some, at some scale. So there is a scale which is similar to lambda QCD in which this theory becomes strongly coupled. And this scale is non-perturbative. And that, that causes the series to diverge. We can actually say more. The weak coupling expansion diverge because the function as a pole at G square uh, lambda equal minus this. But it's a pole. Because the divergence is caused by a pole, you can rearrange the series to resum past it. So you can resum past the first pole. So if you do normal perturbation theory, diverge, and, and, and air, if you try to resum it, you get garbage past the radius convergence. But you can resum it all the way up to here. So that's the resum. Okay, and that's, that's the next pole. Yeah. At strong coupling, the series is asymptotic and it goes bad very quickly. However, people, so Karczemski and uh, Basso, have analyzed the first non perturbative correction. And when you, which as Marcos explained, is only well defined after you do the Borel resummation of the asymptotic series. So they've analyzed, so they've did the Borel resummation, including the, so you can do Borel resummation of that asymptotic series, plus including leading uh, non-perturbative effect. And then you get a curve which goes all the way up to here. So you can beautifully, have a, you have beautiful agreement over some overlapping regime of validity. So it's quite a beautiful story. And all of, this, uh, uh, all of these ingredients that Marcos described, you can see them in action in that, uh, in that, uh, in that model. This is pretty much what I wanted to see. Uh, my early? Oh, <laughs> I'm not good at improvising, though. <laughs> I wanted to be sure to finish on time for uh, the lecture, which is scheduled at uh, 10.30. Uh, yeah. So one thing I could mention is that, so this is a beautiful story. And actually, let, let, me, let me talk about, a bit about the, uh, the story here. 
So there's a long, it took a while for people to derive this, this, this solution. One of the difficult things is, so the basic ingredient in this spin chain is, so there's one ingredient, is the what is called the scattering phase. So remember yesterday I, sh I mentioned this Eisenberg spin chain. We have operators of this type. We have, it's like a qubit. You have two different possible states on each side. And if you take two of these axes and you scatter them across each other, what you get is a phase. And you can calculate this phase order by order in the coupling. But in general, from the integrability viewpoint, this phase, which depends on the momenta of these x, from the viewpoint of integrability, this phase is an input. We can imagine calculating order by order, but you also can imagine being more clever and somehow knowing this phase. And the zero order business of these guys was to try to guess these phase. So they made the first guess. which that's, as far as I understand the story, try the first guess and then they turn the crank and try to extrapolate the equation to strong coupling and it didn't work. It didn't agree with ADS CFT. So then they tough harder and they, they realized that there was some consistency condition which fixed this phase that they had not been careful enough with. So they, by imposing consist con consistency condition, then they, get, they got exactly two solutions. And one of which they were able to show numerically that it was, seemed to be in agreement with the ADS CFT. These two solutions differed at for loop. <coughs> so differed by uh, four loops, one of which seemed to agree with ADS CFT, and they had some other things they found nice about the solution. And, and somebody did the for loop calculation of this gamma cusp, so that was Byrne, Dixon, and collaborators, and they found exact agreement with it. And now, okay, now, are, now the story has settled and there are ways to derive this phase by some consistent principles. It's been checked to, not sure if five loop calculation has been explicitly done yet, but, but this, this story is basically settled now. But it took a lot of, uh, Basically, to get this answer, they really had to put everything they had at strong coupling and everything they had at the time at weak coupling. There's really a lot. Everything that was available at the time went through that, that result. Uh, the other ingredient from the integrability perspective is what is called, so there's the scattering phase. And the other sort of big thing is the uh, wrapping correction. And if you just know the scattering phase, that doesn't fix completely the theory because if you have a chain, if you have a, chor a short chain, you can have, so let's draw Feynman diagrams which describe the evolution of state with four scalars. At one loop, you draw diagrams like that and somehow the rest of the chain doesn't matter. And you could imagine you were doing calculation in an infinite chain. But at some loop order, you can have planar diagrams which wrap around the cylinder. And this you cannot predict from the infinite length chain. So these are extra effects. And it took years to people to arrive at a concrete way to deal with these effects. So now this goes into uh, what is called PMU system, which I will not have time to to describe, unfortunately, but it's a really uh, very interesting development. And one thing I personally like about this system is that it's formulated as, in terms of NLTC property. It, it uses the NLTC property of basic object, but it has this function of, uh, it's called momenta, it's a function of a certain auxiliary complex variable. 
And I like it personally because you can learn this equation without learning anything about spin chains or beta ansatz. You can really start from the actual equation, which involves an elastic property, and they can try to, to work with it directly without going through this lot of baggage. But if you know this baggage, of course, it helps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And another direction is the application to amplitudes. So here, this cost randomness dimension, which governs the uh, infrared divergence of amplitude, is one way to relate amplitudes to, uh, to local operators. But there's a much more general story. It's actually one remarkable thing which turned out to be true, but which is very useful for this, is the duality between scattering amplitude and Wilson loop. And the duality, it's really uh, it's almost unbelievable. So if you have a scattering amplitude, it's labeled by momenta. And if you want to construct an object, you're told that this amplitude is invariant under conformal transformations of these y coordinates. And you can make, it turns out that you can make this invariance manifest by instead computing an amplitude in terms of a polygon whose points are these yi's. Again, in the, there's a vacuum expectation value in n equals four spray angle, in the same theory. So, so each of the edge of this null polygon has momentum pi. And it's a closed Wilson loop by momentum conservation. In a way, this is the simplest thing you, will, you could write that has the right symmetry. On the other hand, you have to be really bold to write that down. And it was discovered by this T duality in ADS CFT. Probably, I doubt people would have guessed it otherwise. But it's a true equality, and you can check it perturbatively. You can do one loop calculation here, you can do perturbative calculation here using final diagrams, and they miraculously agree. It's been checked extensively, and the fact that it works to all orders is something which is made clear by this recursion for the loop integral that I mentioned. So there's no, uh, there's no surprise anymore that it works. We, you know, you, if someone does a five loop calculation tomorrow and it doesn't work, that calculation was done wrong. It's not, it's not because <laughs> it, it will not, no calculation can disprove it anymore. <laughs> and this duality is very useful. One thing, a simple way, and not simple, but uh, one way that a uh, group uh, added by Basso, Sever and Vieira use to describe complicated polygon is to start by a simpler one. So if you start by understanding the four particle amplitude, which is a null square, if you understand it very, if you understand the square very well, you can think of higher point amplitude as a small excitation of a square. So an hexagon, at least in certain limit, is a square plus a small bit. And the small bit you can think of as a local operator inserted on the edge. It's very simple. If you deform a Wilson line, you insert a field strength. So in the limit, the, the six-point amplitude, in a certain collinear limit, becomes this. It's a four-point amplitude, but dressed by some field strength. And now you can apply integrability to this because this field strength, what dominates this, uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, let's say that there's some parameter, u goes to zero in this limit. The amplitude will have some interesting scaling behavior. And that scaling behavior is governed by the dimension of certain operators which govern this limit. And this dimension you can relate to this spin chain. So by computing all this dimension and opposing crossing symmetry, you can even try to fix the coefficients. And that is a long-standing project. They've made a lot of headway on this. 
so that's the direction. But in all of these developments, I think they remain, yeah, I think, uh, I think I should stop here. Yeah. Thank you.